patients are getting the proper education. Like they need to have pamphlets like, listen, you're about, I'm about to prescribe you vitamin. This is a very addictive thing. Be very careful. And if you don't need it, do not take it. You know, whether it's taking it as prescribed once a day, at the end of the 30 days, you're physically addicted to like it. You're sick. You know what I'm saying? And then your mind clicks, and especially if you're an addict, like we have a disease where our brain like functions different. So it, like you might not have known you're an addict this whole time, and all of a sudden something like it and clicks in your brain. Mm -hmm. And that disease in your brain becomes active now. So now you're thinking that you got more pain than what you do because your brain and your mind is tricking you into thinking that. So now you're like going back to the doctor, like, listen, I still got all this pain when you really don't have that much pain, but your, your mind well, is tricking you. Yeah, but heroin addiction does affect our endorphins. Yeah. So you yeah. actually do have more pain. It's not like made up. I mean, yeah. you don't have the ability to, to create your own endorphins anymore. And I think that's the, the worst part of heroin addiction is the person has no ability yet to fight regular pain. That's true. Mm -hmm. Op opioids will convert acute pain to chronic pain. Mm -hmm. They have that permanent effect on the neurons and on the glial cells. That's a fact. That's why I think like Vivitrol like is a good a good thing and should be like more used and like especially like the probation department and, and the jails and the rehabs to where it's like the opiate blockers. So when they get out of these situations, they have 28 days of free where they cannot get high anymore. And then hopefully with the outpatient and being part of the recovery community, they can build that support system and find out the changes that they need to make inside themselves so that they can they can stay sober the rest of their lives. I'd love to interpret this in led away words. Mm -hmm. So when he says detox, that's what our people are doing in the jail. You know, that period mm -hmm. when you lock up opiate addicts and they're sick out of their minds. And I said to the sheriff, you know, that must be a mess. Don't <laughs> put them in the hospital or something. He said, you know what, they're alive. And that's pretty amazing for him to be heroic and keep them alive, but it is pretty terrible mm -hmm. for people to detox in the jail. Your other, your other option is to go to the ER. Um, so we have community mental health, and it's our access point in for treatment. So you call 2638905, and you get uh, screened over the phone. And then you can get out to a couple of different places to get an evaluation. you got to get that evaluation time soon, because they don't want help very long. Yeah. You know, when they get out of jail, 14 days till your evaluation is not okay. Mm -hmm. And if we're experiencing that, um, we need to speak up. Um, but um, we have a summit coming up uh, March 24th. What some of the things that Jeremy's talking about is this, that in some communities, not here, but in other places, um, a person who has gone through detox could maybe be eligible. A physician would have to decide that a person is eligible to have um, a shot in the butt. And for 30 days, they're, um, how, how does it work? You can't revert to addiction. Yes, yeah, it, it, it attaches itself to the receptor so that yeah. So that the opioid cannot yes. get to the receptors that cause them. So if you use your opioids for that, you know, it's not an everyday decision to take your medicine, your Suboxone or your Methadone or whatever. It's not an everyday decision. It's it's in your muscle, and you're gonna um, for 30 days have have some chance to get those recovery resources together. Mm -hmm. um, guess where you get that in Lenawee County? Mm -hmm. You guess it. You know. And Family Medical Center was really close to working with us to dispense the free doses, but the court is really willing. They want to do, uh, Judge Noe is just really interested in fixing this. Judge Shadler is very interested in fixing this. But the probation department would, needs a physician to assess and analyze, okay, now we have a Vivitrol uh, worthy person. They're detoxed in that awful jail environment, but here we are. Let's give them a shot. We need transportation to the shot. Maybe the urgent care down the street, you know, Family Medical Center, I think, is, is uh, rearranging some docs and stuff, but we were so close. So I don't have a doc to give it at this point in Lenawee County, so we're working on it. We're really um, looking for partnerships, looking to open people's minds about it, and um, I want it to be available here. Uh, another one of the treatment options inpatient, um, you know, we've got McCullough Vargas has got a place in Jonesville and that kind of stuff, but we've got good partnerships with Sacred Heart and Dawn Farms. Um, and we have some really great outpatient in Lenawee County, um, but we also need Suboxone and, and uh, Methadone is a way for a person to, it's a medication assisted treatment, um, and we don't have that in Lenawee County. No one's licensed to dispense it here. 
So our people who are on that treatment, also a physician has approved them for it, are going to Jackson or Ann Arbor, so they're on the roads. Oh, and then they're getting like a week's worth in coming home, and I think it's also a drug that can be abused too. Well, so well, methadone, methadone, methadone yeah. is more addicting than heroin is, but it keeps them out of off the needle. <laughs> Or whatever else they're they call their making there. It's available other places. I just yeah, thought it's, if it's possible, but who knows? Yeah, they said it's like five percent of all people that suffer from um, addiction would like generally like could benefit from that like five percent. But the problem with the suboxone is is doctors are only given a hundred patient limit and that's all they can take. Yeah. There's a hundred patient limit. So like like in Monroe, like we're having a problem. We had one doctor that prescribed suboxone and he booked up for six months or a year because it's a year program. So once you get your 100 patient limit, like you're stuck with that for a year. You know, so we're having to go to Taylor and then, like it, it's kind of, to me, like we're kind of having a problem because it's kind of turning into like the opioid thing because now the doctors are like, oh, we're not gonna take state insurance. What we're gonna do is we're gonna charge you $275 for an office visit. And then we're gonna charge you $195 for a second visit. And then every time you come in, it's gonna be $100 a visit. So, I mean, the average heroin addict, they don't have that kind of money. You know what I'm saying? So, we get it more like more insurance. So we'll take it more doctors that are willing to be like part of the solution and not part of And plus, with like the methadone clinics are awesome, but they kind of raise the stigma with addiction. So, now these doctors are scared that their facility is going to turn into the methadone clinic because people used to go there and gather up and they used to buy their meds and used to be selling out for it nasty little situation. So now they think, well, if I mess with these addicts and I supply, supply them these suboxone, then my, my family business is going to turn into what the method is. So we, got, we need to better educate the doctors to exactly what's going on and exactly what this alternative is and how it's not going to be that. How do we educate doctors in Illinois? I can't get in the door. That's what we're having. I can't get in the door to my own doctor for a cold. I'm, no, I'm just uh, we, we have a shortage of doctors. We have a big How shortage of doctors. But you know, the dentist took it up recently. Apparently, they had a big meeting here in Lenawee County on their own. A really big meeting out at Stuntman's or something. That was me. That was you? Yes. Tell us, you, how did you... Well, it was, a, it was a panel similar to this. And we just wanted to do this for the dental community. We are a big prescriber of mm -hmm. opiates. Mm -hmm. And I understand that when a youngster has their wisdom teeth surgery, that's a great gateway to the ultimate heroin addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, but we just we just did it to raise awareness. And unfortunately, we didn't have as big a crowd as we would have liked, but it was a start. So we had law enforcement, we had pharmacy, yeah. and it was teaching people how to use the maps. Um, but for a dentist and pulling wisdom teeth, I would think that, you know, a Vicodin or maybe a low dose oxy is not <clears throat> not inappropriate. But I just had a grandson who went through some pretty massive dental stuff. However, he should have recovered pretty well in three days. We had 30 um, Norcos dispensed. 30. That's, and that's, 10 would that's, have been And fun. that's exactly why we did this. Mm -hmm. When we prescribe, we prescribe like five pills at a time. You handle that acute pain phase, right. and then you're on low trend diet. Yes, absolutely. So, so I think there's a lot of, I mean, that's great, and that's that's really why we're doing this tonight. I mean, every every place that we've gone, there's people, everybody's coming from a different perspective, and they're, we're all learning together, and I think that's how we really help each other, and I do think the recovery doesn't sound like there is a facility, like a place here, like a, yeah, is there any place in, in uh, Sunway County? Not inpatient, but we have a um, Serenity House that's got some color to it, some jazz, and lots of uh, things going on. <laughs> I guess they do karaoke, it's pretty entertaining and stuff, I gotta get there. I just wanted to bring up the, you brought up the, the thing, the community mental health, you know. Um, I work in the field, so um, as far as um, trying to get, and we try to get people into community mental health when we're dealing with this issue. Not, you know, um, I mean, mental health issues, no more than just, but right. some of these. And part of the problem that we're running into with community mental health is obviously the person has to be willing. Mm -hmm. We can't, you know, and obviously they're only going to work with somebody 
Um, and the other thing is, is that right now community CMH is only dealing with it. There's, a, there's an insurance issue. So the Medicaid, and whether or not they have Medicaid, if they don't have Medicaid, you know, they only, they work with, you know, the Medicaid patient, well, they've got to have it or something like that. So what are you doing to... So I have not had a chance to research this, but the very first one uh, form that I had somebody, so we had hospital, we, and you know, to the pain, part of this is challenging because like a Medicare, you know, there is a requirement that your patient is comfortable. So we, there, I mean, there's so many different places, as I mentioned earlier, that we have to come at this because there is a requirement. You're, you're, as a patient, you have a survey evaluation, and if you don't, if you don't, if you don't get what you need as a patient, the, the uh, hospital gets punished for that. So, the, so there's like this balance here, right, on um, how we, um, whether or not we prioritize pain at such a high way, high level when it comes to Medicare, because I think that was something that was brought up in the very first session. But uh, they, someone told me that there was legislation passed la last June that a family member can petition for a family member, like a mental health you know, mm -hmm. person, to be um, <coughs> brought in for drug, to, for, to be hospitalized that, for 70 years. That is okay. such a difficult, like yeah. I said, I work in the field where we have to go and petition that and we, and I've you know, I've had to go in and, and, and try to petition for that because the family says here, this person, you know, but yet they're in this, you know, but the, the system to get them to, to petition is, it, first of all, you gotta, you gotta get a doctor to sign and say, yes, this person can no longer make decisions for themselves, okay? Then if you, you know, when you say petition, you know, are you talking about petitioning to, to order them for treatment? Or, I mean, that is such a, that seems to be such a, like, there's a lot of red, it's almost like, you know, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I, can't, I can't really talk specifics because of the cases that I deal with. Well, um, I, I think what, I mean, I, I think it would be complicated, just like you, when you petition for a family member around mental health, that they're, not ready to be addressing that and petition somebody. I think that's the well, that's probably the last recourse I would expect a family member to do because you know I think it would be a lot harder to do that versus coming together as a community and providing places a, a place for recovery and a place for family. So I mean maybe just as a start, it's you know finding a place here in Adrian or somewhere you know close by so you don't have to drive. I've got an idea. We have a hospital that it's going to be obsolete soon. Let's all take over the hospital for a treatment facility. Are you with me on that? I'm just. Are you so talking no, about? I mean, that's what a community conversation is all about: is like coming up with solutions. And you're right. The the uh, having a family member admit their family member is like I don't think that chances of that person recovering in that process is probably not very high. But I've also. You know, I when I was walking in the pre, you know, the rally that you had in Monroe, I walked uh, with a woman who's I'll never forget it. Her son um, was in recovery. He came home. He went away to be to get away from all the pressure, uh, and uh, he came home and they they were getting ready for church one morning, and he went in the bathroom and he OD, and that was back before we were using this. Um, so. If she had had this at home, she would have been able to save his life. This is the opioid tank. Tank in this. Is that what it's called? Yes, thank you. I'm learning a lot, but I mean, I can't even tell you. So one of the piece of bills that has been co-sponsored in uh, Lansing is to make it more accessible in the pharmacy. So yeah. even so, at schools. Right, and there's three bills. One is to make uh, uh, the, uh, the naloxone or whatever more accessible in the pharmacy than allow it to be in the schools. And then the other bill was, oh, for first responders, uh, uh, peace providers, and firefighters to also be able to carry it, be trained, and, and, and actually utilize it. So, because there is an opportunity to save people's lives here, and I think that's really what we all, why we're all here, why we want to, we want to help each other. So, I do appreciate your point, though. Um, it's and I wasn't trying to be, you know, to say that, and I realize from my experience that's just part of the system sure. that we, we deal with. But you know, having having seen it firsthand and trying to get, you know, when when the families come to me and say, This person needs help, what can we do? And 
there, you know, guests, you know, I've worked in, say I work in both, I've worked in both adult and children protective services, so I've seen it on both ends of the spectrum, as they say, you know, and, and one of the things is with an adult, we have to prove vulnerability. With a child, they're vulnerable for the fact that they're a child. And one of the things is when, when people are, are asking us for help, and part of the, you know, the, the problem that we always run into is, well, they're not willing to get it, and nobody, no doctor out there is saying that, you know, they're making these bad choices, but they're competent enough to make these choices. But yet, they're vulnerable because they're taking these drugs, and they're in a vulnerable state during this addiction. So wouldn't that in itself? make them vulnerable, but they, you know, and, and what we run into, the roadblock we run into, is the legal roadblock, because they'll say, you know, as soon as they contest the, the, the petition, they win out, because you can't, you know what, they're, they're out there making bad choices, they're not, unless they're in harm of, you know, unless they, they, they become direct harm to themselves or others, well, and they obviously are in harm of themselves, but, Again, the, you know. Where do you put a teenager who's having mental problems? Where do you put a teenager? Yeah. In what hospital? Where are the beds? Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> as far as inpatient, in which county? Any of them. Any of them? Because teenagers are they, hard to find there, a bed. There is, there is, you're right, there is. A, in the back row, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question for uh, Sergeant Pillar. Uh, have you, uh, you know, I know clearly they can be in place when they arrest someone who is, is who's, uh, uh, addicted to drugs, but is there a way for them to uh, direct them towards services to, for treatment or recovery? I mean, is, there any, is there any room for that? Is that something that you guys have been looking at already? Typically in the position I'm in, we don't deal with necessarily the people who are the addicted. We deal with more the people who are the suppliers. So I know there are mechanisms in place in